So first, it would be really great to hear your own stories and your experience of being part of the great Unbox Creativity in the UK Festival. So if I could ask Tam, would you like to go first? I'd love to, yes. Awesome. <laughs> that worked well. <laughs> So I think there's a does this work? I think there's a small um, presentation here. Um, so I'm Tamsin Henke. I'm um, the founding director of this. We're an architecture um, practice in, in central London, and we were the architects and spatial designers on pollinations. Um, just to, to give you a bit of context, as, as architects, what we focus on doing is what we call craft ecology. So we're really interested in very high tech and high craft sustainable spaces, whether that's buildings or landscapes. Um, and pollinations was... Have I got a clicker? Can I click? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So I got it, I got it. There we go. Okay, so pollinations was this. This is a, a 2,000 um, square meter um, city center garden in the center of Birmingham. Um, it sprung up for three weeks in September this year. Um, it was a horticultural artwork that had... Um, it was a thousand square meters of planting and then five of these hub trees, which were architectural installations. And I'll talk to you a bit about the research behind them um, as we go on. And there was also a constant program of live events. So that went from talks through at lunchtimes, um, drag events, there was um, Indian classical dancing. It was also a co-grown, co-sown horticultural artwork. So there was a massive outreach program before the project went live for local schools and communities to grow their own plants. And then the first weekend of the programming was embedding that into the forest, so it was kind of physically grown by the community. Um, and there was an accompanying app, um, which, I'm just gonna start playing this film. There was an accompanying app, which was about creating your own seed and planting that in VR in the real world and, and watching it flourish and bloom. So the research came about um, through a, a group that was led by Trigger Stuff, who are creative producers in um, Birmingham, along with Carl Robertshaw, who was the, the design director. And through the research, we found that 80% of the plants in a traditional British garden are non-native to the UK. So the roses from China, the apple tree is from Kazakhstan, um, the, what else is there, the dahlia was from Mexico. So we thought this was a really amazing ability to have a conversation about multiculturalism through horticulture. Um, and quite early on, we were brought on as architects to give this some space. I think Sea Monster talked earlier about, we've got all of these amazing ideas and we want to put them into a space. So it was really important that it was in Birmingham, right in the center of the city. People could just walk through. It was a very low barrier for entry. You could cycle through, there was yoga programming. Um, but that also that it was a space that was slightly separate from Birmingham that felt safe to have these conversations. It wasn't forcing the conversations down people's throat, but it was offering the opportunity to have them. There were seven iconic plants that were telling their story about how they came to the UK and what their journey looked like. Um, so that, that conversation was something that was really pushed through, through the program generally. And also horticulture has an amazingly wide demographic of people that are interested in it. So the traditional horticultural, or people that would attend a horticultural artwork aren't the same people that would traditionally attend um, horse meat disco, electronic rave, or go to a drag Indian classical dance performance. So it made a physical space to bring together a really wide demographic um, of people. Um, we were looking sort of through this idea of wanting to make a horticultural artwork. We then did a lot of research together about how forests propagate in nature. So we were using um, digital studies of the site itself to see where there'd be hotspots, microclimates, uh, sunny areas, shaded areas, and then we worked with these amazing horticulturalists, Chris and Toby Marchant, who programmed out the planting beds accordingly. So we had sort of temperate planting, um, forest planting, sunny meadow planting. And that kind of brings me on to the, the, the research agenda that we all ended up at. But I mean, it was fundamental through the research stages, but it ended up with something that was really the biggest challenge, which was material sustainability mm -hmm. and making a three week long artwork. Um, that really challenged the idea of, of what material sustainability looks like. So everything um, that was in the garden was used from um, uh, the planting fundamentally. It's a huge horticultural artwork, so where does that planting come from? Chris and Toby Marchant were working with um, gardens through um, nurseries through the UK to grow peat-free um, in the UK. 
a lot of the trees were then, um, they were kind of borrowed for the installation. And then at the end of the forest, we gave away all of the plants in the forest. They were also looking at biodiversity, so how we could bring nature into the garden through, well, I mean, as soon as we started planting, we had thousands of bees descend on the center of Birmingham. <laughs> and there was actually a petition at the end to keep the forest there because we realized that there's no spaces like this in Birmingham. It completely changed how people viewed their city. What you're seeing now on the screen is the sunset shift. So this was um, a research piece that was done with a sound designer and a lighting designer to look at how mycelium networks, trees start talking to each other. So we were kind of hybridizing what happens in a real garden and what happens in a, in a kind of um, digital synthesized garden. Um, and then kind of finally from a design perspective, um, we were looking at the material use, so the, the bed of the forest was used cork, which was actually recycled from an installation that had been in the V&A last summer. Um, we're using mulch that then went on to a, an installation immediately after this and was borrowed from an installation previous to this um, and sleepers that could all be chipped. And the trees were using um, extremely ultra lightweight design. So we were working with format engineers to look at um, rotational symmetry to use the minimum amount of material that we would need to make a structure this big um, and then fabric so that it would have an enormous impact physically while using a very, very small amount of material. Um, I think that's where we found the biggest challenge was that it's a three-week installation and this is a lot of material for three weeks. So part of the legacy of this project is now how do we reuse it? Mm -hmm. And it's about to go on tour, so it's going to Bristol um, and Melbourne. So we're, we're trying to kind of give it an afterlife to the project. Amazing. So, thanks thanks mean, so much. No, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think, as you said, like the physical presence yeah. I can only imagine, I'm really gutted I didn't get to go, because I think the physical presence of walking through that space and the transformation of what would be a like, traditional urban center to them. It was, it was, it's pretty built up and pretty dry. Yeah. And in Birmingham, if you want to sit and have a sandwich at lunchtime, there's not really anywhere to go. I'm from Birmingham, so yeah. it, it's, it's a very, very different type of space in the city. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, having lived in London for many years, those little square patches of grass, whenever the sun comes out, everyone just clusters to them yeah. to actually create a space where people can feel that connection. And on that scale, just is really awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so next, we're going to hear from John about our place in space. Thanks, Sharon. Um, hello, everybody. I've got some slides here, I hope. Yes. So, uh, yeah. I'm just going to tell you very quickly about the Our Place in Space project, a little bit about how it came about and what it is that we've tried to do. And as Sharon has said, story is, is, a, is a big part of these commissions. It's a big part of any creative process of how to deliver an engaging experience. So I'm going to try and tell you a bit about the story of the project and the story that we're trying to tell through the, through the project that we've got here. Um, and Our Place in Space is really um, a story around art and around discovery, trying to bring these to new audiences. Um, and it's motivated by compassion and concern for, for our planet. And that all sounds very high-minded and very pretentious, and I'll bring us back now to, to some of what we heard about this morning around that original challenge for the, for the commissions that was put there from um, the, 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 that commissioning process, where projects needed to be open, original, and ambitious. Well, and optimistic, sorry. And mm -hmm. Our place in space comes out of Northern Ireland. I'm based in Derry. The collective is based across Northern Ireland. And openness, originality, and optimism are not naturally associated with Northern Ireland over <laughs> recent years. So we wanted to do something that had a distinctly Northern Irish element to it, but also distilled some of those, some of those qualities. And we thought, what do we have in Northern Ireland? What's our thing? And it's really around difference, us and them, managing difference, conflict, contested t territory, contested mindsets, and, and all of that. So that's the kind of context that the, that the project is born out of. We wanted to deliver some of that lived experience of people in Northern Ireland into a program that could travel across the UK and beyond. And every good story needs a good storyteller. So the artist that's led our project, the creator's vision that leads our project and underpins our project is Oliver Jeffers, um, accompanied by um, Professor Stephen Smart, who's an astrophysicist. This notion of STEAM bringing the arts and sciences together. And the more observant amongst you, those who have sort of come from an arts background may be able to tell which one is the artist and which one is the, the, <laughs> the academic in this picture or the, the scientist in this picture. Um, so this vision that, that, that Oliver had around perspective, around difference, around um, the fragility of, of human relationships, um, boiled down to, to this concept 
of a scale model of the, the solar system. If we could deliver a scale model of the solar system that was playful, engaging, interactive for people to, to come and relate to, um, but also then underlined this notion of the size, the sheer smallness and fragility of our planet, of the Earth within that scale, and then the, the stupidity, the futility of the squabbles, the arguments, the conflicts, and the contests that we have in that. It gave us that sort of jumping off platform to, to come to that from. So the notion was to scale it down to a one to 450 million scale model, which changes from, from um, location to location, depending on the amount of room we've got that I'll come to in a minute. Um, and, and to give people the opportunity to walk the solar system. The artistic impulse came from, from Oliver around trying to make this scale model of the solar system something that was playful, something that was fun, something that was engaging, and trying to create sculpture and piece of art. So it's effectively a sculpture trail of the, of the solar system. And I'll just play some pictures here to give you a sense. Um, there's a video here, yep, um, to, to give you a sense of how that looks in, in reality when it's deployed. Um, but really, that scale, when you're squeezing things down to, to, to the 450 million scale, um, you're, you're traveling, I always forget this, this number, um, a quarter of a million miles with every single step that you take through the <laughs> cosmos. And you're getting this notion of just how far things are. So Pluto is 10 kilometers from the sun in that scale. Um, and you're starting to get this sense of that sheer smallness of, of Earth and the sheer vastness of everything else around it. The start of the trail, you'll see on the video here, that it's, it's really underpinned this notion of us and them and the, the otherness that you're, that you're coming up against um, when you're there. And it starts to bring that home to people on a casual basis as they're walking through it, on a guided basis as they come through on the school tour, um, and just on a visitor experience. They get the artistic engagement with the sculptures, and then they get the, the more philosophical engagement with what it's actually talking about, what it's actually trying to tell you. We had to put in a, an engagement program around that, of course, um, and we've set world records. There was a world record, you might have seen at the start of the video there, for the biggest number of astronauts <laughs> congregated in one place. Um, we've put runners, skateboarders, cyclists on tours and races around the, the, the solar system. We've done sky watching, we've had silent discos um, all the way along the solar system as well. Um, and we've um, generally tried to create as much engagement, as much buzz, as much feeling around the, 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 the sculpture trail that we can as we put out there challenges that, that, that they've been and that we've heard about some about earlier was yeah, Oliver is, a, is an artist at an international level. He's, a, he's an author, um, an artist who's globally recognized, he's a multi-million selling author of, of books and stories. He wanted to get that story across, but we also had to do this in a way that was deliverable within the completely ridiculous constraints of time that we had with Unboxed. Um, so you can see the sculptures in the, in the video there, how, how they work, um, how practical they are, how transportable they are, how mobile they are. They can be vandal proof, fire proof, climb, on, climb onable proof, insurable, and all, and all of those practical constraints that we had to factor into that decision making process over the, the time of the project. Um, and then around that sculpture trail, we had to build a wider experience to get that wider engagement and to ensure that this was a meaningful program and a meaningful process, that it wasn't just sculptures that landed in your community. The trail opened in Derry, moved to Belfast, and was in Cambridge over the summer. It's currently in Liverpool. 300,000 people have now visited the trail already um, with another two locations to go. We're moving back home to North Down um, in the new year and um, to wrap up the program in, uh, in February. And it will stay there as a, as a legacy piece beyond that. But that wider experience is communicated through an app. So we have a digital app here, um, which can take you on a virtual tour of the trail from your own garden, your own front room, your own street, your own school playground, or enriches your experience going along the, the trail. We had the Festival of Us, which saw um, Darren Aronofsky, Chelsea Clinton, Jamie Dornan, um, Baroness May Blood, and a range of kind of global figures coming to Belfast to talk to an audience of 10,000 people around future issues of the planet, identity, sustainability, and, and all of those things. We have an education program, which has now reached 25,000 young people directly across the UK with these fantastic curriculum resources designed by Oliver and authored by Stephen. Um, we have series of creative challenges with Chris Hadfield and Nicole Stott at NASA astronauts, Ella Podmon and, and Neil Gaiman, challenging young people to, to inspire them into creative acts, to, to create their own creative responses around the, 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 the future of the planet, the us and them, the, the conflict dimension of it. We have a Minecraft world which is launched yesterday in beta form on the Our Place in Space website um, and is going to be launched on the minecraft.edu um, website in the next two weeks, which is going to be huge absolutely across the world. 
Um, and just to bring this back to storytelling, the project has also inspired the, the, the vision, the process that Oliver was on, and maybe we'll talk about some of this later on around how some of these ideas were already in the ether before we were able to bring them to Unbox because of the time period that was there. But it's culminated in Oliver's latest book, which I'm um, not quite contractually obligated, but encouraged to <laughs> plug at every opportunity. Um, just been published by HarperCollins, available in all good bookshops now. And Oliver is currently on a book tour around the, around the UK, if anybody wants to catch up with him. Um, but it tells this story of this sense of perspective. With distance comes perspective. As you're traveling further from Earth, the smallness of the planet and the futility of the conflicts, which have really shaped us as people, just, just becomes more and more absurd and more and more ridiculous. So that's me. Thank you. Awesome. Bel um, so, yeah, Belfast and Dublin. Um, I believe Oliver is in Belfast and Dublin this oh, week. Yeah. Belfast. Um, but no, that, I, I just I love that this was brought to life in Northern Ireland. And as you said, like, optim like op openness, optimism, and originality just colliding with that culture just must have been fascinating. So we can get into it, but Jenny, it'd be awesome now to hear about Dandelion. Sure, thank you. It's so great to hear about your projects and to think about the connections between members as well. It's really good. So I'm from Dandelion. We ran a project recently concluded all across Scotland that encouraged um, as many people as possible to sow, grow and share, largely their own food, um, but also music and ideas and creativity. Um, and the project ran on the arc of the growing season. So we started in March, April um, and concluded with a series of um, approximately 500 targets harvest festivals um, in the second weekend of September. So we started um, with children and young people because our kind of all of our themes and things relate to food uh, security and sustainability and, um, and future proofing essentially. So we started with young people um, ultimately working with 468 schools across Scotland. All of them were engaged in a, a beautiful schools program where we distributed tatties, potatoes to the less well versed <laughs> to tatties to 98,000 school children who all took their tatties home in March, planted them um, and harvested them at the end of the project. And they also, oh, let me just see. Um, they also, the high schools that were involved, there's 120 high schools who all received one of these controlled environment growing cubes. Um, which we'd specially commissioned and we've used them as a kind of uh, twofold across the project. One, that they are an actual uh, physical, you know, a, a possible solution to some of our challenges around food growing in the future. Um, so these were deployed across all of the schools where the, the children used them, the students used them in citizen science experiments. So they tested out what, the, what different kind of humidity levels looked like, how you would um, change the environments that you grew in and what the results might be. They played the plants music all sorts of things. But the, the cubes, as we'll see in a minute, um, also functioned uh, as a kind of catalytic sort of art installation that allowed us to open up all sorts of conversations about the future of growing, but also about food um, and food security and uh, sustainability, um, access to food, because the project was born um, out of the pandemic in a time where I think most of the creative team involved were really kind of acutely aware of the role of community, but also the real challenges that people face. And I think there was a, a, a real sense within the creative team um, that there had to be uh, there had to be real genuine community benefit out of every single aspect of this project, which to run on a year long, <laughs> six months really, the delivery cycle was, is quite a difficult thing to do. Here you can see the cubes, um, which were part of our bikes on tour. We took the cubes, the growing cubes, to uh, towns and cities all across Scotland to just allow the public right up close to ask about the technology behind them and to um, begin those conversations about uh, where our food comes from and, and where it might be produced from in the future. The cubes also had, um, we commissioned a series of 10 different musicians who commissioned music specifically for the cubes. They were also installed in museum and uh, uh, gallery environments. They were at the V&A in Dundee. They were at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. They were in the Scottish Parliament. Um, and if you got up close, you could hear the music playing from them. Um, and it was an incredible array of world musicians and lots of really kind of uh, folk and indie and trad music in there as well. Our music director, Donald Shaw, um, is 
is of Capra Cayley and the Celt massive Celtic Connections Trad Festival that runs in uh, Glasgow every year. So there's this real kind of roots and folk strand um, that went all the way through the project, which felt very fitting given Scotland's history and heritage and growing um, in, in the past. And a part of the project was to look at both past um, and a progressive future. So we also did 12 unexpected gardens all across Scotland. So this was, in each case, we had 12 gardens, in some cases, literally unbroken ground. We had, in each place, a partnership between an arts organisation a community, and a community group to take over a piece of derelict land and turn it into a productive growing space. We put in an emerging creative producer in each place who ran a programme of creative events over the summertime and a musician in residence who enhanced the programme and created new music for the space. And we've got lots of these images, but some of them are fantastic. You just see the difference start to finish in, in that time frame was incredible. We also did one of our unexpected gardens on the Union Canal. Um, it runs between Glasgow and Edinburgh, and this amazing boat, the Biomatrix, it floated up and down the canal. We did public events all around it, and the Biomatrix, and you know, we're talking about sustainability and about uh, the legacy of these projects, it will ultimately dissolve back into the canal in a rather pleasing sort of circular economy. These are the Kelpies, an iconic Scottish location, um, and our beautiful barge, which I think was the, for the first time in 120 years, there was a market garden on the Union Canal, which was quite pleasing for the canal communities involved. Here's the cubes, and I think that's in the, uh, the V&A and various different museum locations. And there they are, built into our pavilion of perpetual light, which was the stage that was the backdrop to the massive music festivals that we ran. So we ran two huge festivals, one in Glasgow in June and one in Inverness um, in September, with 44,000 people at the one in June and 25,000 at the one in Inverness. So you start to see why those numbers that be, keep being reported in the press make no sense. So that was our, <coughs> our kind of opportunity to bring together all the different elements of the Dandelion Project. So there was lots of music, lots of community. We also ran a talks programme that explored all the ideas and themes behind um, everything that we were doing. There was an under fives area in each place to show that, you know, even the tiny... <laughs> back to it. And then the final um, piece was the Harvest Festival. So on the 9th of September, although the timing wasn't great, um, we had a culmination where every single school who was involved, all of the unexpected gardens, all of the community groups, all held simultaneous harvest festivals in an effort to make that connection between Scotland's kind of traditional growing past and what it might look like to kind of reignite that as a community celebration where we share food and we share ideas and community and look at what a multicultural Scotland looks like that's a wee bit different maybe from that traditional very agricultural rural heritage and what it actually looks like in kind of especially in urban uh, Scotland now and some of the numbers amazing it's probably enough <laughs> no, no no it's amazing because I think I mean having three small boys as soon as like we grew, I grew runner beans with them. Just seeing that wonder, they're like, wait, what? This turns into that and I can eat that, you know, that process of wonderment. Totally, it was my children, it was my, I've got three as well, and it was the middle one who kind of forced me to go into this project. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. I love the so much. <laughs> oh, that, that is amazing. And I think that's, I mean, to sort of the, the beginnings of your story, I think we heard earlier about, uh, sort of Dev and Angel and Angela's experience of the R&D process, but also just of coming together in these, what would people could perceive as mismatched groups and being like, well, how are you guys, like, what, like, going from that to then what you've shared, mm. it's just like, what was your experience of that, like, bringing your commissions together, and were there any, like, surprises along the way of, of what you uncovered, and, like, where the challenges were, where the inspirations were. Just wondering. So for us, there was um, four creative directors all working in slightly different bits of the project. There was the uh, Scotland's Rural and Ag Agricultural College, which were a really key partner, and they brought us through the project. We had 60 students on placement and all over the gardens and different aspects of the project who were the tatty team, um, <laughs> and they were brilliant. And the uh, SRUC also did all of our growing because growing was obviously a massive part of it. They grew 100,000 plug plants over the course of the, the six months, which uh, they say almost broke them, um, <laughs> but working with them, and we also worked with, there was a, you know, there's so many different, the, the Hutton Institute to really kind of 
hot on vertical farming and um, the future of growing. And uh, to be honest, somebody mentioned it in one of the panels earlier on. It was just that completely different expectations of how, what the process towards a project mm. is and the different time frames. And somebody said earlier that everybody was quite polite and it took a while before you sort of challenged, you know, we're here and you're here, how do we get there? I think we had a lot of that, not necessarily the politeness, but just, you know, different sectors and also different measures of success. So even within the context of our gardens, for some people, the most important thing coming out of the garden would be the best creative programme you can ever imagine or the biggest number of people. And for others, it was the highest yield. How many carrots are we going to be able to grow? And it was, yeah. you know, like those are quite <laughs> simple things, but actually it completely changes the way you build your programme and you, the way you develop the project, what it is you're actually valuing at the end of it. And I think even now, I don't know that everybody around the table, although our mission is quite clear, I don't think everybody has valued the same things even within Dandelion out of the project, not by a long Sure. I think that's the thing because it's whenever because just, just thinking about whenever your expectations then come into contact with the reality of doing the work and being in conversation with people that are experiencing it um, I was just wondering John because you were talking about in Northern Ireland you know you were came together as a commission you knew very intentionally that you wanted it to be about in conflict zones or in post-conflict zones, how can creativity, imagination, openness, like what could that look like? I was just wondering, what was your journey in exploring that, developing that, and then how did the community respond whenever it landed? Yeah, I mean, it was partly with different challenges, I think, in, in Northern Ireland around building the, 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 the partnership. Um, everybody knows everybody in Northern Ireland. It's a really small <laughs> place. Um, <laughs> So we have worked with new partners on this project, but they're partners that we knew deeply already, just hadn't previously worked with them. And we've worked with existing partners. Um, and even you know, one of the sort of, uh, I think, successes of the, of the commissioning process that Sam was talking about earlier on, the, there were two proposals that went through from, from Northern Ireland. We succeeded, the other one didn't, but they became a key part of our delivery team to make this happen um, around the whole events program and the activation on the ground. So we were able to, 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 to keep that knowledge and the, the, the groups with the ambition to, to do that, to, to, to bring them in. Um, and then in terms of uh, some of those challenges, we built the partnership. So the Nerve Center, the organization that I work for, started as a musicians collective. We are absolutely not a state body in any way. We are not encumbered by bureaucracy, administration, or processes that get in the way of, of getting things done. So we were very flexible and responsive and, and more comfortable with the timelines of the project than some of the other partners, but we did need statutory input as well. So we partnered with um, museums and galleries in Northern Ireland who basically own Northern Ireland's cultural and, and historical heritage. And when we're trying to get planning commission to, to get things done, working with local authorities, having that governmental imprimatur mm -hmm. certainly helps. Belfast City Council were the co-commissioner in Northern Ireland, so have, having them on board obviously helps with, that, with all of that processing as well that we probably wouldn't have been able to achieve just as the nerve center on our own. <laughs> Um, so, so building that partnership and getting those sort of balances right was really important and some of the stuff, you know, the, so the museums weren't involved in some of the elements where maybe we were having to move faster than they would have been comfortable with doing um, and then they absolutely are involved. The legacy of the project will sit at the museum um, in the, the, the Ulster Transport Museum in County Down, that's where the trail will reside at the end of the, the, the year. Um, and then on the, on the conflict side, um, again, it's, it's really around um, getting people to understand. One of the key challenges we've had in the Nerve Centre and I think across the cultural creative sector in Northern Ireland is that we, every site of conflict tends to assume that their conflict is, is more intractable, more entrenched, and has been horribly, horribler and nastier than anybody else's. And actually, a big thrust around diversity and inclusion and community relations work over the last 20 years has been trying to get people to look outside before they look back inside and realize that actually what we've been through isn't particularly uncommon or unusual. So it's a, it's a much easier sell, I think, and this taking it to the cosmic level meant that people were able to get involved um, with no sort of notion that it was about conflict identity or anything like that, because 
try and find a young person, a school age child who is not interested in space and the solar system, I, I <laughs> challenge you because we've been um, blown away by the level of interest. It's on every curriculum that we've mm. come across in the, in, in the world so far. Um, and those materials have, have been delivered you know, a long way outside the UK. And people are engaging with it on that level before they come into any of the stuff around identity and sustainability. And it's sort of it's a bit of a Trojan horse to get people to engage. <laughs> Trojan horse, I like that. Yeah, because I think um, from my own perspective, growing up in Northern Ireland, I remember seeing a police station in England for the first time and being confused why there wasn't a 40-foot wall and barbed wire. And I, and I can just imagine that again like affording people the space to have that perspective and to see also then the connection with people going through that and I think that's what was really awesome about the fact that you sort of set yourself the challenge of setting that world record and for people to feel part of that and to come together I think it was it was really I think amazing to see that you know people just were so happy just to step into that space and to be part of the sort of the story that you were building really wonderful. I was just wondering as well, um, Tamsin, you were talking about sustainability and I think the detail and the levels at which you explored sustainability in the work that you were doing. And I was just wondering, were you able to like communicate that to the people that then came to be part of a walk through the forest? Like, did they understand or, or were you able to sort of really celebrate all of the different ways that you approach sustainability in the commission. Interesting. People were really interested in it mm. and people were asking about it. I think it's something that's so prevalent in the mindset, particularly in urban centres at the moment, of, of what, does this, what does this mean? How is this made? And it was also, it was a huge construction process. It was in the middle of town for, I think we were building it for three and a half weeks. Um, the Commonwealth Games had just happened in the same square, so people were kind of curious and buzzing around this, this area, and they saw it go up piece by piece, and it was quite a dramatic process that um, these sort of 40-foot trucks would arrive with bits of the trees in them that would then get assembled on site, and then the canopies were winched up from the ground up, um, and then the, the horticulture started arriving, and these trees were arriving on their sides in 40-foot lorries and being hauled up straight. So people were kind of gathering at the fences to look in to see how it was being built and asking questions about it. And I was joking on the, the way in, but we laid a, 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 um, t a fleece down across the site at the beginning. It was green. And we, have to, we needed to protect the, the ground and also we needed to control water movement across the site. There was a plan for, at the end of it, it was going to go and become a green roof substrate for, for future projects. So we were all kind of excited about it. But on social media, people were really upset about the idea that we were using AstroTurf because they thought that's what the final... So I think people were kind of engaged in it way more than we thought they were going to be. And then at the end, we did this huge giveaway of the plants um, that was kind of curated... The, the plants were coming out of the ground, being put onto trolleys and being given to people just coming from the center. And people wanted to know, what is this plant? How do I grow it? Where is it best to go in my garden? What kind of wildlife is it going to attract? And people were quite opinionated on, no, 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 I don't want, I don't want the dahlia. I want the, the bush over there. <laughs> and I think that was nice because it was sort of sustainability on quite soft yeah, levels that people so could nice. engage with it on a, in a way that affects their garden. Yeah, I want to increase biodiversity in my garden. Which plant should I take from this this tray to make mm. that happen? Or I, I don't it's know. That I think curiosity. It's, it's, yeah, that people are really curious about yeah, how to yeah. be. I mean, I think the the sort of more technology technological side of it, and some of the fabrication of things like those trees, people were sort of backing off on. But it was nice that there was there's ways in for lots of different. It's like people. that's awesome. But yeah, can I have that huge, plant? But can I have that plant? <laughs> 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 Jenny, what about you? With them um, in regards to. See, like sparking people's curiosity. Mm. I think, I think someone mentioned about the unintended consequences of setting out in this commission. Like, was there anything that struck you about whenever you guys set off with these boxes containing plans? Yeah, I mean, it was a constant voyage of discovery yeah. <laughs> on all fronts. Um, I think harder than expected from the sea monster experience is pretty applicable yeah. for us too. The time frame was just crazy. And I think, I mean, for us, like the community side of it, and I, as John said, you know, you know 
other arts organisations in Scotland. You know who else bid in? And all the art groups that we were working with to build all these gardens, they've all got their own things going on. And some of them, quite rightly, were quite sceptical of a massive project with a huge budget on a very short time frame and us kind of blustering into the middle of that. And the only way you really solve that is through trust and the time it takes to build up those relationships. And we didn't have that on this project. We just didn't. Um, and now we're kind of at the other end of it, looking at what the challenge of that really is. We've, these are capital projects. They're literally in the ground. What do you do next? <laughs> When they've, you know, and legacy has not been a big kind of priority for Unbox since the beginning. So we're in a really difficult space with that now when you've built up that trust and those kind of community relationships. What do you do to nurture and sustain that going forward? And I think it is a big, genuinely, I think it is a big question about these kind of one-off short-term short -term, time frame projects when I think there is this increased pressure, and I think rightly so, to have the art be meaningful and sustainable and in the context of all the cost of living and all the challenges that we're sitting in at the moment. And I think we've been wrestling with that mm. a lot all the way through. Um, and I suppose one of the answers to it is in the kind of investment and the talent development stuff. And that's one of the things that I think I'm most sort of proud of within this, the context of our project is those 12 emerging producers who this was their first kind of big game in most cases and they got a good sizable budget to do an amazing creative program over the summer and in some cases I think that will set them up in a, just an unrepeatable sort of way for the rest of their careers you know that's and the kids that have been engaged some of them some of the stories even just today we got a report through from the the tatty team and how that had gone and some of the students there who are neurodiverse who are not confident because they were out in a public space talking about something that they're really confident about they could explain what the plants where and where they had come from and why, you know, how to look after them and just creating that platform for that ex expertise to be shared in that way was really transformational. And I think, um, as Tamsin was just saying, with that very low barrier to entry, you know, everybody's got a, a, a story to tell about food or about growing or the plant that they've killed. You know, there's always, there's, it was a really easy conversation yeah. starter, which I bet that meant people got kind of, and the curiosity thing, people got stuck in really quickly. Yeah. Um, and you couldn't, one of the unpredictable things was where the conversation went, because it could go everywhere from, you know, the quite high tech aspects of the growing cubes and the kind of sustainability implications of all of that to the generation you know my granny taught me how to grow these beans that make this soup you know it was the absolute massive range of that that I think was one of the great joys of it all mm. yeah I mean I can imagine that I, I mean I, I, I well no I can't imagine what it was like to go through the R&D process for Unbox this complete unique set of circumstances where you're given such creative freedom especially if you're in areas where you know there's others that are all part of this. But then I think, you know, whenever we saw with Sea Monster, then the process of exploring the ambition, the creativity, the imagination, the potential, the curiosity of doing this. And as you said, there's the trust then yeah. and the relationships that you build, that it unlocks and it creates spaces for people to have an ex experience that's so unique. And again, you don't know how that's going to be brought forward. And maybe that's okay in some ways, but also then there's so much learning to be had, I think, from what each of the commissions have been through. Um, and it's so important for those stories to be shared. So that's why I'm really thankful for this opportunity today. But for John and for Tamsin, for you guys, what next? You know, what... What have you learned from this that you want to bring forward in the work that you do next? Um, what is your hope for the work in the commission and how that is brought forward? Yeah, just curious. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's what next for our place in space yeah. and there's what next for the nerve center. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what's next for our place in space, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's been one of the kind of constraints of the, the timing that we had to work under for the project meant that um, I think from Unbox point of view, more than, than, than ourselves anyway, legacy was not, not a priority up front. It was something that was coming in later in the program because getting a program up and running and deliverable was the priority up front. Um, but yeah, we, we developed an international strand of the program with Unbox support. Um, and there's a number of places around the world that would like to bring the trail there. We're, we're actively pursuing um, an opportunity 
potentially in Vietnam, South Africa as well. Um, there, there may be an opportunity ar around that trail development. The educational program is, is good for at least six or seven years. We, we develop educational resources as, as part of our bread and butter. This is the best quality resource that we've ever done. It's fairly future-proofed and it's pretty transferable across multiple curricula. So again, there's lots of opportunity for that to be embedded as a, as, as a legacy of the, of the project. For Nerve Center, yeah, I mean, I, Derry, where we're from, was the first UK city of culture, and there's ongoing debate about the legacy of, of, mm. of, of what, what legacy that delivered. The Nerve Centre was heavily involved in delivery of, of that year and in the bid process as well. If we hadn't developed the capacity we did through that, we would not have been in a position to do what we're doing with our place and space and unboxed, and it is organisationally. It's just a constant layering of contacts, capacity, and, and know-how, and calling cards for what you can do. So we're and markedly improved organization for having come through this process. I think the partners would say the same as well. It's been a huge learning curve, but all of that learning goes into our next project ideation and into our sort of future development and growth of, as an organization. Yeah, each commission is such a wealth of material and learning surrounding it. I, on my, on my to-do list to look at those educational things. <laughs> and Tamsin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a similar thing in terms of the, the pollination's legacy and then, and then what what the team are doing next. I think the pollination legacy, there's, there's a huge hunt to now take these, these trees elsewhere. They were designed to be able to, to pack down and to move. Um, so now we're, we're kind of locating them elsewhere. And interestingly, the gardens are, the, the horticulturalists that were designing the gardens are focusing on um, ultra seasonal planting. So planting that's, that's really sort of typical for those areas, those microclimates. So talking about doing them at different times of year and exploring what that looks like. But I think the whole team generally, we spent a lot of time on site together. We were building this, you know, physically the architects, we were, we were building the installation. The horticulturalists were planting the plants. The creative directors were there um, talking to people every day. And I think that made this incredible genesis of the team while we were on site and we are all kind of continuing to collaborate and doing another project now on, on biopiracy. Um, and I think that that's huge for all of us being quite explicit in our particular areas as kind of architects or researchers or creative producers and suddenly realizing that other disciplines are, are closer than we thought they were. Mm. Or the, the, the separation from them is more enjoyable than we thought that was going to be. So mm. hopefully I think the collaboration is something huge that we all took away from it. Amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like whether creating spaces for people to reflect on diversity or spaces for people to shift perspectives or to question their assumptions around perspectives or even just to get excited about sinking their fingers into soil and being connected with the planet and realising the abundance that is below our feet. It sounds like each of your commissions has definitely had an impact, and it's really exciting mm -hmm. to hear that you know, the journey doesn't stop with Unboxed, but exploring what comes next. So I wanted to thank each of you for joining me today, and I really look forward to your stories being part of the Collective Futures Guide. Um, but yeah, and also thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, you can find out more about each of the commissions at the back of the room. And if you would like to find out more about the collective futures work that the RSA is doing, then do please feel free to look for us at the rsa.org forward slash unboxed. And you're more than welcome to become part of the creative conversations happening in November and also to explore the guide whenever it's launched at the end of November as well. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you.